Good morning. morning. Greetings. We're glad you're here today. Uh, You can look around and see we're a tad thin, probably a lot of people on the road. I know the Langdons are, and our pastor and his family are on the road. Uh, Be praying for them, for them all to come home safely. Amen. So it's good to have you here today. We, uh, if you're here for the first time, uh, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. Uh, hope you feel at home. Um, a lot of smiles around the area. So shake a hand and get to know people. We're glad you're here. Um, in the way of announcements, in two weeks, we're going to have a class start called the Survival Kit. And I've been given the privilege to teach that class. Um, so I'm going to give it a little plug here. It's, um, it's basically basics to get us back on track. It's great for new Christians, but personally, it was the first time that I was in the class, I was about 60 years old. And I've been in the class a couple of times, uh, taught it a few times, and um, I'm going to have the opportunity to teach that here. It's a six-week program. There'll be a little bit of memoriz- memor- memorization. Get it out. A um, little bit of study time each week, but I know it'll be a benefit. It'll definitely, definitely refresh you spiritually. Um, we have a quarterly newsletter available in the Welcome Center next Saturday, and I'm assuming it's at the Fairway, the men's breakfast. Does anybody know? Well, you know what? We're going to the Fairway next Saturday morning at 8 a.m. at the Fairway. Um, there's usually a small, short devotion uh, given there. And then we have our breakfast together and good fellowship. So guys, come on. If you've never been before, please come. Um, planning to attend myself. All right. There's also a, a create to connect also next Saturday, January 8th. I don't really know the details of that. Probably more details in your bulletin. Now, next Sunday, there's going to be a congregational meeting. So there'll be no small groups, congregational meeting, no small groups. And immediately following the congregational meeting, there's a special call meeting to establish a search team for an associate pastor. Okay. Very important that you participate, that we put together a team that can find the man that needs to be our associate pastor. So we'll be praying over that, considering it and come together next week after our congregational meeting and help develop that team. Are we good? Okay. Uh, Any other announcements that I might've missed or details that need to be shared? All right. Well then let's come together for worship. Are we ready for worship? Here she is. Let's all stand and sing together. Happy New Year. It's good to see you today. That wasn't very good. Happy New Year. There we go. It's good to see you today. Well, um, we've kind of made a tradition of singing Auld Lang Syne the first Sunday of the year. So you'll notice the words are a little different, more prayerful, more religious um, than your typical Auld Lang Syne. But you know the the song is everybody's favorite song that they don't really know the words or what they mean. So this one, you'll know what the words mean. So let's let's bow our heads together and start start our time of worship with the Father. Father God, we just we come to you thankfully with grateful hearts that we get to start another year following you and turning our eyes to you this morning as well as the days to come. We thank you so much for the blessings that you pour into our lives. And we just ask that you that you be with us this morning, that you are near to us in this time as we just worship you and give you all the praise. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Your 
and grace will never be forgot. Your mercy all my life will be my soul's forever song, my story and my light. From mountain top to Father, for giving your son that we will know him, that we will know salvation, that we will know grace, that we will experience mercy, that we will experience love. Open up. 
up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and leave me in your love to those around me. the table this morning holding on to the promises of your covenant at First Baptist we exercise a policy of open communion and what this means is that if you or born-again believer in Jesus Christ, whether you're a member of this church or not, we invite you to participate with us in communion. We welcome you to do that. Is there anyone here today that does not have the cup and wafer and would like one? Phil's ready, prop it back there to give you one. Okay, we're well covered, Phil. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> we're, we are encouraged of course, not to take communion without examination, to be worthy of the communion, to be prepared to partake in the communion. Um, so let's take just a moment to reflect and pray silently before we begin. Father, I pray today that each and every one of us is prepared to take in communion, a reminder of the body and blood that was broken and shed on our behalf. I pray, Lord, today that you'd bond this body of believers in communion, that we'll be one as we look towards you for guidance, direct, direction, Lord, and purpose. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'm taking the text for communion from Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 30. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it. Let's pray again. Father, we pray today that we'll truly understand the meaning of the bread today. That it represents your body that was broken for our sake that you surrendered yourself to the cross on behalf of our sins, our lives. I pray today that we'll appreciate, fully appreciate what you have done for us in Christ's name, amen. And he gave to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body.
And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. Once again, Lord, your blood was shed on our behalf. I pray today that we'll recognize the depth of love in each drop that you gave yourself for us and each and every one of us and collectively we'll recognize our purpose in Christ as our Savior. For we pray it all in his precious name. Amen. And he gave to them and said, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many unto remission of sins. But I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, I say unto you, I shall not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Can we have our praise team come back and lead us in worship? is who you are. You are a savior. You are a friend. You are almighty God. You're a miracle worker. That is who you are. You are here. And we worship you.
guests in our church, if you're a guest in our church and you have kiddos, you can see that the kiddos are headed out of the sanctuary right now, and they're headed down to the opposite end of the church. And we have a kids program, and our kids volunteers will be there with them, and they'll have a Bible story, and sing, and dance, and play some games, and then you can pick them up there after the service. Glad to be here today. I hope you are too. The text today is going to be taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn to that. If you don't, there should be one there in front of you in the pew that you're welcome to use. We do have free Bibles outside. If you need a Bible, you take one home. We'd be glad that you did. You know, this is a time of year when people make resolutions. Um, <clears throat> some people don't make resolutions though, and there's a reason. They don't want to feel like a failure if they do not complete the task of the resolution. And then there's still others that do not make resolutions because they don't really see the need for it. I guess there's no room for self-improvement. I don't know. But most of the time when we do make resolutions, it has something to do with the physical side of us, the fleshly side of us. We want to shed those pounds we've picked up since Thanksgiving, or we want to start working out at the gym. I remember when I used to work at the gym very regularly, and it, it was just an onslaught of people in January. They, it, was, there was, it was hard to find a machine to use because of all the people that showed up. But it began to thin out after work week three or four. And in February, maybe part of the crowd was still there. And by the end of February, there was a residual crowd that was still there. And by March, the, most of them were gone. We don't do well with resolutions. But there's a difference I want to show you today between a resolution and a commitment. A commitment. And we're going to see that in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We're going to see where we're urged to make a commitment by the Apostle Paul, the writer of Romans. And here's how it reads in the New American Standard. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today for each of us being here. Because I know, Lord, there's no mistakes where you're involved. There's no happenstance that you define life. And that for each of us here, there's a reason we're here. There's a purpose. And I pray, Lord, today that each of us will find that purpose. We pray, Father, that you'll just touch our hearts. Thank you for the wonderful music we've experienced and pray that you've been blessed by us lifting up our voices to you. I pray now, Lord, that for every heart, that you'll take away all the distractions and help each and every one of us begin with me to focus on nothing but you and your glory. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. The scripture starts out here. Paul writes, I urge you, brethren. I urge you. So he's speaking to believers. He's speaking to the church of Rome, which was made up of both Jew and Gentile. He's speaking to all of them collectively. Because when he starts out here and he says to present your bodies, he's speaking individually, but he's also speaking collectively. And we at First Baptist could look at that and say, God is urging me through Paul today, because I'm one of the brethren, he's encouraging me today by the mercies of God. When he says urge here, he's talking about something more than, hey, do you think maybe? He's urging, he's prompting, he's, he, he is, in the, in, the, in the King James it says, I beseech you, which is a plea, a beg. 
He's saying, I'm begging you by the mercies of God. And when he speaks of the mercies of God here, he's saying to them, because of what God has done, the mercies that he has extended to you and I, he's urging us to remember those mercies. He's asking us to not forget about the forgiveness of our sins. To be relieved from the pressure of, the, of our own sins. He's urging us because God brought the gift of the Holy Spirit. That if you're a born again believer, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. By the mercies of God, he's saying even eternal life. So he's given us forgiveness. He's given to us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he's given us eternal life. And Paul wanted to remind them of those mercies. So I'm urging you by the mercies of God upon your life to surrender yourself or as spoken here, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. See, this is a metaphor for the sacrifices of old. In the Old Testament, you saw where they would bring the, the ram they would bring the very best from their flock and they would give it to the Lord. There were times in the Old Scriptures, in the Old Testament Scriptures, when they didn't bring their best. They would bring God their blind lambs, you know, the bird with the broken foot. They would bring them something less. And he was always discouraged by that. He says, I want you to bring your best to me. So the question today, individually and collectively, are we giving our best today to God and his purpose in our lives? Are we giving our best? Are we half-hearted about it? Well, you know, I show up on Sundays. Ooh, isn't God blessed? It's great that you're here, but do you think God should be impressed by us just showing up? After he's given us forgiveness of sin by sacrificing his own son on a cross to take on our shame and our sin, we're going to give him something like a bird with a broken foot, a lamb with the eye put out, something blind maybe. The metaphor here is that they would bring the sacrifice, but, he's, but the sacrifice would be slaughtered and then placed upon the altar. And Paul says, I'm not asking you to slaughter lambs anymore and place them on altars. What I'm urging you to do is to present yourself as an individual and collectively as a body, First Baptist, to surrender yourselves to God, to present them as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So you see, he wants us to be a sacrifice. What's that mean? Well, he wants us to give our lives. He wants us to surrender. He wants us to be totally obedient to his direction. And throughout the Old Testament, he constantly said, sacrifices are great, but what I really want from you is your obedience. That's what I'm looking for. I want you to be obedient. My word tells you how to live your lives, but yet you choose to say, nah, it doesn't fit me. No, I don't agree with it. You know, the scriptures are very strange. It's sort of an all or nothing thing. Well, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. I don't believe God really wants me to whatever. But yet the scriptures clearly say it's God's desire that we put, fill in the blank and we say, nah, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't think I can do that. I don't, um, yeah, that stretched me too far. That's too much. Do we realize that when we choose to disobey God's guidance that we are in disobedience to him and disobedience to God is sin. Here's the good news. We're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. We all need a savior. We all need to 
get things right with him. We all have a need. We're all stumbling. And I think part of it is because we don't know how to deny the flesh. See, Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You can talk religion all you want. You can ask people, you know, do you believe in God? Well, I'm a religious person. Great. Not going to get you anywhere, but great. Because Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be my follower, and you need to be Jesus' disciple or follower, because he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no salvation outside of Christ. There is no other way. You see, many people tell you, oh, there are many ways to get to heaven. What I believe is this. God created heaven. It's his heaven. Therefore, it's his way. I don't know what other heavens there are. It's God's heaven. And it's going to be God's way. And what's so strange, what's so hard to grasp is the fact that he's made it so simple for us to come to Christ. He says, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. But Jesus said, yes, that's true. But there's more to it. You got to deny yourself. What's that mean? That means you're no longer first place. You're no longer king of the throne. You're no longer calling the shots. But you, when you say that I'm going to follow Jesus, you say, I'm going to surrender my will and I'm going to look to the will of the Father. Now, I'm going to tell you now, it's going to be hard to find the will of the Father in most lives if all you do is come to church on a Sunday morning. It's difficult to do. You need to be in God's word, seeking God's ways, seeking God's will. You need to be in study. There's a lot of people who think that there's no room for their life to go to Sunday school or to go to small groups or to go to anything like that. My personal take is this. If you don't need to come and study the word of God in addition to coming to services, you probably need to be teaching us about the word of God. Because if you know that much, if you've got it, that much knowledge of God and that much knowledge of his will and his way, you need to be teaching. You need to be participating because we all need to be in the will of God. I think some people avoid the will of God. I really do. I think some people don't want to come and hear what God demands, but what God requires, what God desires, because they're saying, because I know I'm not going to do it. It's like a resolution. I don't want to hear it. If I don't hear it, but you know what? In the depths of your soul, you know what's good and right. I take you to James chapter four in my mind, where he says, to he who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. To him it is sin. So if you know, you know it'd be good to study my Bible, but I don't, sorry. You know it's good, you do it not. It's sin. I know that I should be, I'm going to step on a toe or two here, I'm sure. This may be the last time I'll get to preach, so here you go. I know in God's word in Malachi, God says, bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse and see if I won't bless it. He says, try me and prove me. But there are those that say, I can't afford to tithe. My friend, you can't afford not to tithe. God can do more with, you, with, with your 90% than you'll ever do with your 100%. I guarantee it. I have a life that can prove it. And here's the point I want to make. In the Old Testament, do you know the Jews gave somewhere between 28, 35% of their income, their earnings to the Lord? And we get all griped up because God says, bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse. To he who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. When we're walking in dis disobedience to God's word or choosing fleshly desires over spiritual desires, we're not being living sacrifices. And that's what Paul is urging us to do. Look at what God has done for you and tell me that you should not respond to that. And he said the response is to be a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. Holy means pure. 
godly sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is their spiritual service of worship. I like the King James, I'm sorry, where the King James says, because this is your reasonable service. This is your reasonable service. This is a reasonable result. Given what God has done, what I'm urging you to do today is a, is a reasonable request. In fact, it's the logical request. He gave his life for you by dying. He wants you to give your life to him by living. Living out the faith in front of those around you. Loving when it's not easy to love. Let me tell you, I struggle with that one. I can be critical. I can be harsh. I've been praying all night long to be loving. Lord, I need to be loving. I need to reach out to people more. I need to encourage people more. I need to love them more like you love them. See them through your eyes to do your will. He says that's a reasonable outcome. After what God has done for us, it's a reasonable outcome that we would live for him. <clears throat> When we know by the word of God or the prompting of the Holy Spirit what the will of God is and we choose not to respond in obedience, we're choosing sin. We know this urging today is a good thing. That Paul is telling us a good thing. And he did it not only to say, I'm gonna stress your lives beyond measure by asking you to be a living sacrifice. What he's trying to do is to say, I'm gonna put yourself in a position of having a blessed life, to put you in the position to have a blessed life. When we walk in, dis even as believers, when we walk in disobedience to God, we're compromising our salvation, we're compromising our faith, and God's gonna get our attention. If he doesn't, something's wrong, and here's why I say that. The scriptures tell it that he will chasten those whom he loves. Well, I, I've never been chastened by God then I would tell you to take a good, hard, long look at your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he says, I'll chasten those whom I love. For me, it goes back almost 30 years, no, almost 40 years. He took everything. He took everything. Because I told him I was going to do something that I knew that I knew I wasn't going to do, and he proved that I was a liar, and he took everything. Thank you, Lord. Because that's what it took to awaken me to his goodness. That's what it took for him to rattle my cage and empty my bucket so I could do nothing but look to him, and I finally got it. He loved me. He loved me enough to correct me. He loved me enough to restore me. He loved me enough to pursue me after all the years I had ignored him as a believer. Giving him my minimal when he was wanting it all. In the prophet, in the book of Haggai, it's written that God's desire, and they knew his desire, was to rebuild his house, his temple. And they weren't doing that. They weren't taking care of business. And he asked him a question. I want to read that to you. Haggai 1.1, 1, 1, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, and the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, governor of Judah, unto Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, this people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lies in waste? Now therefore saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe, you clothe yourselves, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You see, they put their will, their plans, their goals, their flesh before the will of God, and they were always in want. He said, well, I'm not in want, Roger. So you're saying everything you have today, you can stop right here, and you're fine. Well, gosh, no one can say that. No, I think we can. I think we can. I think we can if we're saying Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for me. I will live for him. Jesus is enough for me. And here's why I say that, because he's already promised me. He's going to clothe me like he does the lily of the fields. He's going to feed me like he does the fowl of the air. He's going to take care of me. He's promised me to. Can I trust him for that? Then why do we place so much focus, if we can trust him for that, why do we place so much focus on accumulating and having and pressing our own plan out there, knowing God has a better plan? And here's why I say it better. You may not have as much stuff. That's possible. It could be that you'll struggle at times following Christ. It could be. But let's look at the end game. How much of the stuff you're accumulating are you taking with you? How much are we going to be able to cram into the coffin? Nada. Nothing. Nothing. It's appointed unto man wants to die and then the judgment. We don't get to take our stuff with us. The world tells you that the one who has the most toys wins. No, that's not the way it happens. The winners are those who say, Christ is my Lord. I live for him. He is my master. He is king of my life. He's on the throne of my heart. I follow him. His dust is upon me. I follow him. That's the winners. See, one day there will be a separation of sheep and goat. The sheep are those who know Christ. The goats are those that don't. There's going to be a separation, a day of reckoning, a day of, 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 of coming to final terms with God. I'm thankful. I'm confident. You know, Paul also wrote, I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep me against that day. And that day he was talking about was that day of reckoning, stand before God in judgment because he knew something. See, Paul was not a saint. Paul used to persecute the Christians. Paul used to kill Christians. In fact, Paul was there hand, hand, uh, holding the cloak when, this, when people were stoned to death. Paul was not a good guy, but he was Jews, the Jew of Jews. He followed the law. He did everything that he was supposed to do. They thought he was a real something, but he wasn't. But see, when Paul wrote this, this latter piece and said, I know in whom I have believed, on the Damascus Road, he came to Christ. He came to Christ and he surrendered his, his life to Christ. And, and it's probably a pretty good example of someone being a living sacrifice. We can look at most of the disciples beyond Judas and see they were pretty much living sacrifices. Every, every one of them, except for John, who was, who was isolated on the, um, um, on the island of Patmos, all the rest were crucified and killed in some manner. They were living sacrifices, though, every day of their life. How are we doing? How are we doing when it comes to being living sacrifices? I gotta tell you, folks, this past week has been a week full of repentance for my life, recognizing how I have faltered and failed recognizing how I have compromised in the smallest of ways, but still wrong. How are we going to pull this off? He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. 
we find here that there are only two options. We can choose to conform our lives to the ways, thoughts, methods, and discretion of the world in the flesh, or we can choose to conform our lives to the will of God and become living sacrifices. It's radical, it's a thorough, and it's a universal change. You see, we, we want to live in the gray so much. Well, I kind of, sort of, I'm a pretty good person. Who is the measuring stick here? You, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, grandma, grandpa, all fine people, I'm sure. But who's the measuring stick here? See, we devise our own measuring sticks. I have found it very interesting in my life, and I've done it too, so I'm not sitting here faulting you. I just want you to recognize how silly it is. And that is this. We tend to, to look at some sins and say those are terrible. Why? Because we don't do those sins. And other sins, we say, well, you know, we'll justify. Why? Because we're participating. We do that with sin. We try to logic it away. We try to educate it away with knowledge. You want true knowledge. You want truth. It's in the word of God. I'm not going to take fault for academia, but too often there are people that think that they're highly intelligent and they're moving their lives in a very foolish direction away from God. Because in the end, standing before God, we can throw all the degrees we want at him. Heck, we can throw our baptismal certificates at him, our church membership at him. We can throw anything we want at him, but he is going to ask one question. What did you do about my son? What did you do about my son? Did you reject him? Did you ignore him? Or did you receive him? What'd you do with my son? We determine in our own ways what it takes to get to heaven. Roger, I'm a good person. Excellent, I'm glad. I'm glad we need more good people. But are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ? Well, I've never done this or this or this. That's great. I've never done anything extreme. That's wonderful. But what have you done with Christ? That's the question this morning, folks. What have we done with Christ? And I ask that uh, not only to those maybe that are here that have never given their life to Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior and stand in their defense as their advocate when they stand before the Father and he says, you're a sinner. And Jesus steps forward and says, but they're mine. So what have you done with Jesus? Because set, Jesus said in the, in the last times in judgment, he says this, many will say, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name and that in your name and this in your name and that in your name. And he's going to say to them, I don't know you. I don't know you. How can that be if we did those things? Well, if you did them by your flesh, maybe for your own satisfaction, Maybe you did it because you determined that that's what it took to get to heaven. So I'll just do this, this, and this. And that'll get me to heaven. We've got to go back to the word. And the word says, no man comes to the father, but by me. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? And if you have, are you being a living sacrifice I love the scripture, verse two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, when, he, when the word prove here, I wanna focus on that. When the word prove here is used, it means that you can now discern and therefore experience what the will of God is. Wouldn't you like to experience what the will of God is? Wouldn't you like to feel and be assured that things are right with God? That I'm in his will. Praise God, I'm in his will. And that what I do in his name, he will breathe upon and make it more than it is. 
Why? Not because of how good you are, but how great he is. That you now have a life that can impact eternal consequences. Think on that. Everything around us, folks, is going to come to the point in time of eternal consequences. How it plays out is up to you. And as I said before, that's what's so silly, isn't it? It's so easy to accept Christ. The difficult part is denying self. That's the tough part. To deny oneself, take up your cross and follow him. But he says, renew your minds. Let the inward change produce the outward result. You see, where the spirit, the temperament, the disposition of the mind are not renewed, an outward change is of little worth. It's in fact short-lived, like a poor resolution. Ephesians 4, 21 and 24 says, if so be that you have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the form of conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, that's what was trying to be accomplished when he tells us to follow this, to become a living and holy sacrifice. Righteous and holy. Why do we need to renew our minds? So that we can now discern and experience that which is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable in his sight. And there's no way we can renew our minds without immersing ourselves in his word. extensively seeking his guidance and fellowship in prayer. We're not gonna do it by coming on Sunday morning and planning it for an hour. We're gonna accomplish it by surrendering our lives, our time, our energies, our efforts to his will. We're going to accomplish it by being in his word and being on our knees and responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and surrounding ourselves with the work of God through service to others, to love God by loving others, to serve God by serving others. What's this all add up to? To have this, to be immersed in his word and seeking his guidance and fellowship and prayer and responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and surrounding ourselves with the work of God through service to him. That sounds a lot to me like a living sacrifice. Lord, I'm yours. Do with me as you will. Lead me where you want. Show me the way. Show me how to be a living sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord, I pray today that you will <clears throat> help us to be honest with you and ourselves. Begin with me. Help us, Lord, to see where we have faltered and failed. Show us how to live up to our salvation, a price so hefty that our lives surrender to you seems meager in comparison. I pray, Lord, today that you would move upon each and every one of us to reconcile things with you. And if there be one here who does not know you, I pray, Lord, that they'll reach out to myself or maybe someone around them, family or friends, or contact Pastor Tom when he returns but that they will reconcile things with you and surrender their lives to Christ, seeking your forgiveness, surrendering themselves, denying their flesh, taking up the cross and following our Savior, Christ. 
For I ask it in his holy and precious name. Amen. I give you my life, I give you my trust, Jesus, for you are my God, and you are enough, Jesus, Jesus.
trust you in your presence. I will live. Well, has it been good to be in God's house today? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word, Lord. And I thank you for everyone who's here. I thank you, Lord, that uh, through the music of the message that you've come amongst us. And I pray, Father, that you'll bless each and every life that is here. Bless the Lord for being in your house. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless them with your knowledge, your strength, your goodness, your mercy, and that we can extend that to others. Help us, Lord, to be the body of Christ you desire for us to be, to represent you in this community and beyond. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.